The Troubadour by Peter Michael Sherman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Taylor. The Troubadour by Peter Michael Sherman. So far as parties go, Jocelyn's were no duller than any others. I went to this one mainly to hear Paul Kutrov and Frank Alva bait each other, which is usually more entertaining than most double features. Kutrov adheres to the onward and upward school of linear progress, while Alva is more or less of a Spinglerian. More when he goes along by himself, less when you try to pin him down on it. And, since the subject of tonight's revelations would be the pre-Mohammedan Arab culture, I'd find Alva more inclined to my side of the debate, which is strictly morphological and without any pious theories of progress. I'd completely forgotten that Jocelyn had mentioned something about having a special attraction, a Mr. Phelis, who she insisted was a troubadour. I didn't comment, not wanting to spend a day with Jocelyn on the phone exploring the Provence. The night wasn't too warm for August, and there were occasional gusts of air seeping through the layers of tobacco smoke that hover over the assemblage. As usual, it was a heterogeneous crowd, which rapidly formed into numerous islands of discourse. The trade winds carried salient gems of intelligence throughout the entire archipelago at times, and Jocelyn walked upon the water, scurrying from one bay to another, sopping up the overflow of culture. She visited our atoll, where Kutrov's passionate exposition had already raised the mean temperature some degrees, but didn't stay too long. Such debates didn't suggest any course of social or political action and couldn't be true to any of her causes. My attention was wandering from the Kutrov-Alva variations, for Bill had only been speaking for ten minutes and could not be expected to arrive at any point whatsoever for at least another fifteen. From the east of us came apocalyptic figures of nuclear physics. From the west, I heard strains of Mondarian interwoven with Picasso. South of us, a post-mortem on the latest betrayal of this or that aspiration of the people. And to the north, we heard the mysteries of atonality. It was a while I was looking around and letting all these things roll over me that I saw the stranger enter. Jocelyn immediately bounced up from a couch, leaving the crucial problem of atmosphere poisoning via fission and or fusion bombs suspended and made effusive noises. This then was the troubadour, Mr. Phelus. The main attraction was decidedly prepossessing. Tall, peculiarly graceful, both in appearance and manner, dressed with an immaculateness that seemed excessive in this post-Bohemian circle. There was a decidedly musical quality to his speech as he made polite comments upon being introduced to each of us, with an exactness in sentence structure, word choices, and enunciation that bespoke the foreigner. Jocelyn took him around with an air of conducting a quick tour through a museum, then settled him momentarily with the music group, now in the darkest Schoenberg, only partially illuminated by Wozniak. I watched Phelis long enough to solidify an impression that he was at ease here. But not merely in this particular discussion, it was a case of his being simply at ease, period. Kutrov was watching him, too, and I saw now that there would be a most likely permanent digression. Too bad. I had a feeling that when he came to his point, it would have been a strong one. Hungarian, 
do you suppose? he asked. Alva examined the evidence. Phelus had high cheekbones, longish eyes with large pupils. He was lean, without giving an impression of thinness. He had not taken off his gloves, and I wondered if he would come forth with a monocle. If he had, it would not have seemed an affectation. I wouldn't say Slavic, Alva said. He started off on ethnology, and we toured the Near East again. I jumped into the break when Kutrov was swallowing beer and Alva lighted a cigarette to observe that Phelus reminded me of those Egyptian portraits, although I couldn't set the period. If those eyes of his don't shine in the dark, I added, they ought to. A brief pause for appreciation, then Jocelyn was calling for all men's attention. She managed to get it in reasonably short order, took a breath, then dived into announcing that our special guest, Mr. Phelus, was going to deliver a song cycle. Phelus arose, bowed slightly, then nodding to Mark Loring, who brought forth his oboe. These songs were not conceived or composed in the form I am presenting them, he said but I believe that this arrangement I use is an effective one. I call this Song of the Last Men. He nodded again, roaring, and the performance began. His voice was affecting, his artistry unmistakable, and there were overtones in his voice that gave an added eeriness to the weird music itself. The songs told of the feelings, the memories, and despair of a nearly extinct people, one which had achieved a great culture and a worldwide civilization. The singer knows that the civilization has been destroyed, that the people created by this culture and civilization are gone, the few survivors being pitiful philahine, unable to rebuild or bring forth a culture of their own. There is despair at the loss of the comfort the civilization they knew brought them, sorrow at their inability to share in its greatness, even in memory, and a resigned certainty that they are the last of the race. They will soon be gone, and no others shall arise after them. There was silence when Phelus finished, then discreet but firm applause, as if the audience felt that giving full rein to their approval would make an imperious racket. Phelus seemed to sense this feeling and smiled as he bowed. These are not the songs of your people, are they? asked Jocelyn. Phelus shook his head. Oh no, they are far removed from us. I am merely an explorer of past civilizations and cultures, and I enjoy adapting such masterpieces of the past as I can find. This arrangement was made for you. I shall make a different one for my own people so that the sonic values of the music and the words agree with one another. Kutrov blinked, then asked him, well, can you tell us something more about the people who created this cycle? It has a familiar ring to it, yet I cannot tie it in with any past culture I have heard of. Jocelyn cut in with the regretful announcement that Mr. Phelus had another appointment and called for a note of thanks to him for coming. More applause, this time unrestrained. Phelus smiled again and swept his eyes around us as if filled with some amusing secret. Then he said to Kutrov, You would find them quite understandable. I wandered over to the window in search of air and noted that someone had indiscreetly left a comfortable chair vacant. I was near the door so that I could hear Jocelyn say to Phelus, It was very moving. Why, I could almost feel that you were singing about us. Phelus smiled again. That is as it should be. 
Of course, chimed in Loring, who'd come up to ask Thales if he could have a copy of the score. That's the test of an expert performance. The lights were dimmed again by the fog of tobacco smoke, and I could see the street quite clearly by moonlight. I decided I would watch Phalus and see if his eyes did glow in the dark. I saw him go down to the sidewalk with that graceful stride of his, hands in his pockets, but I couldn't see his eyes at all. Then a gust of wind tugged at his hat, and for an instant I thought he'd have to go scrambling after it. But, quick as a rapier thrust, a tail darted out from beneath his dress coat, caught the hat, and set it back on his head. End of The Troubadour By Peter Michael Sherman